Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Faisal J. Abbas, editor of uh, Arab News. It is my absolute pleasure uh, to be your moderator um, uh, this afternoon uh, on one of the, uh, what I like to think are one of the most important uh, sessions of uh, this, uh, what has been a very uh, splendid uh, Arab uh, media forum. Um, um, this afternoon, we're discussing the Arab image uh, in the West, um, the US uh, as an example. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, joined on uh, stage with uh, a panel of fantastic experts. Uh, to my uh, immediate uh, left is Mark Dunfry, who is the uh, founder of the Institute of uh, Cultural uh, Diplomacy uh, in Berlin. Mark, welcome to Dubai. I believe this is your first time. Yes, no, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Um, right next to Mark, we have Hadley Gamble, um, CNBC International's uh, Middle East correspondent. Um, Hadley has uh, interviewed uh, a, a very wide array of uh, uh, people in the region, uh, all, uh, all the way from King Abdullah of uh, Jordan uh, to President Abdel Fattah Sisi to uh, prominent businessmen uh, such as Mohammed Al Abbar. Hadley, uh, welcome on stage. Thank, Thank you, you for being with us. Thank you for and, having uh, me. Last but certainly not least, uh, from the U.S. State Department, we're delighted to have their regional uh, spokesperson, uh, Nathan Tech, on our panel uh, to give us a bit of an American perspective on what we are about to um, uh, discuss. Uh, thank you so much uh, for attending uh, this, uh, this panel. Um, I am delighted to inform you that uh, on the occasion of the Arab Media Forum, Arab News, the Middle East leading uh, English language daily, has partnered with YouGov um, the global leader in online polling, uh, to commission a study. Obviously, we didn't need to commission a study um, to, to tell you that there is a problem with the image of Arabs abroad. But what we wanted to find out is how, exact, how bad is that problem exactly. So um, um, the study has been uh, uh, made available uh, through uh, the Arab Media Forum in Arabic online. If you go to their uh, website, arabmediaforum.ae, and uh, you'll see a limited edition of Arab News available for uh, your, your, uh, our guests today. News on, uh, dot com, um, to see the whole results. But for the sake of um, this uh, panel discussion, uh, we've prepared the following video, and uh, please join us uh, in getting this quick recap. Many of us feel there is a misunderstanding when it comes to the Arab image in America. I had to slit a few throats, but I got it. They attacked his embassy, kidnapped his commanding officer, assassinated his men. few realize how much misunderstanding there actually is. According to an Arab News YouGov poll of over 2,000 Americans, 65% admitted they did not know much about the Arab world, and three quarters of Americans polled would not even consider traveling to the region. That is perhaps wise, because according to the same study, 81% of Americans cannot accurately identify the Arab world on a map. Not only that, Remember Agrabah, the fictional sultanate from Disney's Aladdin? Welcome to Agrabah. Well, 21% of Americans polled actually think it's a real country. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Oh dear. But there are some insights here for Arab journalists. 52% of respondents consider the media to be effective in depicting the true image of the region. Half of the respondents said their own U.S. media does not provide enough coverage of the Arab world. Not only that, but international English language newspapers, websites, and TV news channels are seen as the most accurate when it comes to covering the Arab world. Arab arts, science, and culture, as well as society issues, were the two key areas where U.S. media consumers would like to know more. This means that with more effective communication, this inaccurate perception problem can be fixed. Right, interesting uh, findings there. Hadley, ladies go first. 
So obviously, Hadley, as a, a correspondent who is an expert on the region, you travel quite a lot. You go to Saudi Arabia, you go to Jordan, um, you're here in the Emirates. Uh, perhaps uh, you don't really classify as one of those 2,000 uh, people that were uh, appalled. But I'm very curious. Um, when you go back home to the United States, what do people tell you? Um, you know, how did you survive the Middle East? Uh, do people think we still, uh, you know, ride the camels and, uh, you know, there's <laughs> wars everywhere? Um. I think that you have to break it down uh, to start off with because CNBC News is an international business news network. So the folks that we speak to on a daily basis are high net worth individuals, they're running banks, they're running finance companies, the question really is not about the countries we're talking about. They know where Saudi Arabia is. They know where the UAE is. They certainly know where Dubai is, and they're very, very interested in what happens here, not just because of the price of oil or the IPO of Aramco, but also because these are some of the most connected societies in the world, and they see that, honestly, as a business opportunity. Um, and I think that's where the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the secret weapon but, but could be. But not all voters are top executive, Hadley, and we're talking about the masses. And True. And I, I was just wondering if you had any insight as to why is there that much ignorance? Yeah, so there are a couple of things there. One of the things that people might not necessarily realize, and why should you, is that, you know, when you're talking about public school systems in the United States, public school systems curriculum are generally determined at a very local level, and oftentimes they determine that students in the U.S. public system don't really need more than you know, one semester of geography. So really pinpointing the Middle East as, as a problem area or thinking that this is a place that the United States doesn't necessarily know where it is, Americans are going to have the same problem, unfortunately, if you're talking about Portugal or you're talking about you know, Asia, China, Thailand. I mean, it, this isn't just a Middle East you know, centric issue in terms of, of finding these places on a map. I think that's important to recognize. It's not about disenfranchising the region or anything like that. It's literally about a lack of knowledge. It's an ignorance level. And I think that, you know, despite the fact that, you know, we're talking about the Sultanate of Agrabah, I found that quite funny, disturbing, but really funny. <laughs> Anyone who's around my age, 35, would know every word to every Aladdin song. And that's the reason for that is, you know, Disney's amazing marketing abilities more than, you know, the fact that people aren't really paying attention to what's happening in this part of the world, right? So I think you have to really break that down and see this more as an opportunity because there are opportunities there. Any business person would tell you, you know, the lack of knowledge actually can work to your advantage because that means you can set a narrative. So it's uh, a matter of education. I'm glad you say that, that it's, there's no conspiracy there. It's just uh, <laughs> ignorance. And, uh, you know, just for the record, um, I wouldn't give you 35. I would think you're much younger. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's go to Nathan, uh, uh, Nathan Tech. So one-fifth of Americans believe that the Sultanate of Agrabah from the film <laughs> Aladdin uh, is real. Yeah. Um, what the video didn't mention is another part of the study, which is 38% would endorse a travel ban <laughs> from Agrabah to the United States. And I just wanted to check how would you deploy that? Would it be a complete travel ban or just laptops and iPad on flying carpets? Well, Faisal, you're starting with the hard questions already. My God. Uh, well, if there's one thing I've learned as a spokesperson, it's not to answer hypothetical questions, That's especially right. if they deal with fictional countries. Fair enough. Uh, but <laughs> you have enough problems as it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can tell you, yeah. Uh, so, but look, I, I, there's no question to put it diplomatically that those numbers are a challenge. Um, but at the same time, I, I would urge those in the audience, especially those of you who are government decision makers, to not despair with those numbers. Uh, you have to take into account, as, as Hadley mentioned, that the United States of America is a country that historically is bounded on two sides by two massive oceans, right? The Atlantic and the Pacific. And to the north and south, we only have two neighbors, right? We are traditionally a country that has always had a sort of isolationist instinct. Uh, and the average American in Topeka, Kansas, uh, you know, we'll have to travel thousands of miles to even go to an international border, right? Uh, so it's important to keep in mind the context and the, the unique context of, of the United States of America uh, and its culture. But despite all that, I think there's been a historical affinity, uh, believe it or not, between Americans and Arabs. Uh, you know, if you look at history, for example, the first nation to recognize the independence of the United States from Great Britain was not France, it wasn't Holland, it was, Mo it was, it was Morocco. Uh, Sultan Muhammad III, uh, in 1777, uh, uh, issued a document uh, listing the United States as one of the ports of call uh, for Moroccan traders in order to expand his opportunities commercially. Uh, and there's a treaty of friendship between the United States and Morocco that extends over 300 years, and it's the longest standing American uh, international treaty uh, in existence. Uh, 
Um, at the same time, if you look at you know uh, the role that Americans have played in the Levant, uh, in in Beirut and in in Damascus in the 1920s and 30s, how American missionaries established hospitals and schools, and for example, the American University in Beirut, the American University in Cairo, where would the Arab world be without those institutions, right? Uh, so you've always had inside the United States Americans who are passionate about traveling to the Arab world, about learning Arabic, about meeting this culture, this civilization. Uh, and, and so I, I would not despair. There's always hope and there's always opportunities to be had. And I think it's up to Arab governments to take creative and risk-taking uh, steps in order to capture that once again. Um, let, let me ask you a follow-up question uh, on that. Um, as you know, the, the United States um, uh, is a democracy. And as we all know, governments cannot go against the will of the voters. Sure. So kind of a sort of a, the logical question is, if there's so much ignorance, that means people could easily be misled by perhaps uh, people who have agendas against the, the Arab world. Um, as you probably know, going on different television channels and reading the press here, um, in certain periods of time, there's a lot of hostility towards U.S. foreign uh, policy. Um, so, you know, does it just all make sense that uh, as long as the public are not well informed about the region in America, as such, they will not vote for politicians or policies that are pro uh, what we call uh, Arab uh, sure. Arab issues? Um, you know, th that seems to me like there will not be a solution uh, in the long run uh, if we were to start going to the grassroots now. Um, do you think that has an impact at all uh, on U.S. Uh, foreign policy, or does the United States government go against the will of people when it sees that it's the right thing to do? Well, first of all, let me say that we have an abiding interest in standing with our Arab partners around the region. Uh, and, and so, and we've, this has been a long-standing commitment of ours. You know, I, I think especially with this new administration, you know, we have come to really been speaking loudly and bold, boldly about the threat of Iran and the destabilizing impact that it has uh, on the region. Uh, and I think that, you know, we are, we've always, you know, throughout the centuries, throughout the decades, um, been strong partners in terms of economic partnerships, in terms of political partnerships, and especially in terms of secu security partnerships uh, to meet common threats. So, uh, you know, I, I would reject that premise a little bit that the United States has been somewhat against Arab interests. I don't think that's exactly the case. But you raise a really important point about the democratic nature of American decision making. Uh, you know, in, 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 in when we make our foreign policy, um, it, you know, the, the White House obviously is the number one driver of that, and the president is the only member of the executive branch, aside from the vice president, who is elected entirely by all 330 million Americans, right? And of course, Congress also is extremely important. Uh, you know, you have 535 members of Congress, each of whom represents a district, and, you know, their number one goal is to make sure that the, their constituents in that district um, know that they are acting in their best interest. And so the key, I think, for any Arab communicator is to realize that uh, if you want to influence decision makers in Washington, you have to go outside of Washington, right? If you want to uh, influence a key member, for example, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, don't go to the Washington Press Corps only. Also look at his district's media uh, and his district's constituents and find ways in which you can build partnerships on the grassroots with that member of Congress's um, uh, constituency as well. Um, I, I think it's just really important for, for foreign, foreigners to understand that the United States of America is a diverse country uh, and uh, we have a lot of you know, very, very sort of a vibrant media scene that has to be taken advantage of. Um, let me ask Mark a question before I go back to uh, Hadley. Uh, actually, Mark, Hadley spoke about education. And education is, uh, I've had the privilege of visiting you at the ICD, at the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin, and I think um, you guys are doing a fantastic job um, in kind of creating a dialogue. Um, allow me to ask you, are you preaching to the converted? Because your institute, the, the kind of attendees, former diplomats, heads of states, academics. These aren't the people uh, that are the problem. Um, and similarly, uh, don't you think uh, you should be spreading cultural diplomacy in the United States, for example, where um, you know, there's a, perhaps an issue in the education or even in the, in the Arab world? No, you definitely you hit the nail on the head, and I think this issue of preaching to the choir, so to speak, or to the converted is a problem fundamentally with cultural diplomacy. Typically, those who will come to a cultural diplomacy initiative or institute are those who do have an interest in learning about other cultures, those who do have a passport, etc. Speaking of the USA, one uh, statistic that was not mentioned earlier is how many Americans even have a passport. Uh, it's now 30, maximum maybe 35% of Americans, depending on the study, have a passport, meaning the vast majority of Americans don't even have a passport, and the vast majority of Americans, even if they had a passport, 
passport probably didn't use that passport to go to the other side of the ocean. They may have gone to Canada or Mexico. So that's the fundamental challenge that we have. As you said, we have to reach not those 30% with a passport, but those who don't have a passport. And I think, therefore, uh, education is number one, uh, raising awareness. I think that's the importance of the media, a forum such as this, in terms of determining what we're talking about and what we're prioritizing, et cetera. And then the ultimate, of course, would be, as you said, to bring those individuals to other communities, to other countries in terms of exchange. So definitely that is important. And the, the, the key strategy there is to try to be creative. If you can't get those individuals to come to a cultural diplomacy event in Berlin, do it in Texas or do it somewhere else or try to bring them for other reasons, economic reasons. We host once a year an event, the Berlin Economic Forum, uh, trying to bring individuals and, and, and leaders from other fields uh, who may not come to a cultural diplomacy event. And I think that's the challenge, whether it's governments or non-government organizations, to try to creatively bring the audiences really that, that need uh, these sorts of forum. Um, Nathan talked about uh, aspects of the U.S. soft power, about the American University in Beirut, the AUD here in Dubai, the AUD University of Cairo, you have Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. seems to set uh, the kind of standard when it comes to soft power tools. Um, I have to say, it is not something we do very well um, in the Arab world. Uh, there's been a fantastic initiative that has been launched uh, here in Dubai uh, just uh, this week. But um, allow me to ask you, uh, did we miss the train? I mean, can this image, that negative image, that as we've seen from those Hollywood films, that essentially the Arab world is a bunch of thugs, that there are wars everywhere, as we've seen from the study, a lot of Americans those who have passports don't, wanna, don't want to come uh, to our part of the world. Um, two questions. Is it too late? And can you think of any examples of another nation brand that has had an image problem and fixed it? So first of all, it's not too late. There's a huge potential. That's why we were so happy to hear about the new soft power initiative of the Emirates uh, starting last week. We're hoping to work together also with the Emirates to see how we can bring that forward. So definitely it's not too late. For me, a success story would actually be Germany. Uh, we've been based there 17 years. What nation had a worse reputation <laughs> given the 20th century than Germany? Uh, and well, we have a could it be that Germany or the Made in Germany brand could even be something we're talking about now? And as you look at the European Union, I would argue it's actually the strongest brand in the European Union. Some would say maybe even in the world. Uh, from a cultural diplomacy point of view, the key secret to success was actually expressed by Professor Joseph Nye himself, professor at Harvard University who coined the term soft power, uh, when he said you need to have consistency between the foreign policy and the cultural diplomacy. If you don't have consistency, it won't work. And unfortunately, the USA, for many periods of time, has not had the consistency. We're sending drones with one hand, jazz musicians with the other. How can one build trust? And I think Germany, given the unique historical you know, <laughs> transition that's taken place in the 20th century, has been very consistent. If you look at German foreign policy since the end of the Second World War up until now, fairly consistent in terms of soft power. That gives much more credibility to the cultural diplomacy. The second thing that Germany does is they invest a lot. Uh, the German Foreign Office, the Auswärtiges Amt, spends more money on cultural diplomacy than on political diplomacy or economic diplomacy. If you look at the German Academic Exchange Service, Deutsche Welle Media, uh, uh, the Goethe Institute, the magnitude is also immense. Uh, and I think Germany is a good example to see, yes, it can pay off. Uh, the brand Germany is definitely benefiting from this consistency and from this investment. Uh, other countries are noticing as well. China started in 2004 with the Confucius Institute, now the fastest growing cultural diplomacy institution in the world. So the world is realizing the importance and and also the benefits of cultural diplomacy. Just to correct something you said earlier, the USA actually, I would not, I don't think you could say is a success story. Uh, since the end of the Second World War, the, the end of the Cold War, the USA basically said, okay, Cold War is over, no more need. And they've been cutting, cutting, cutting on soft power and cutting, cutting, cutting on, on cultural diplomacy. Even during the Obama administration, Fulbright was cut, I think, by 20 or 30 percent. Uh, now, under Trump, they're debating maybe 50 percent, <laughs> cutting more. So at a time when definitely the USA, and I would say the Arab world, needs more cultural diplomacy, we need to make sure that we're doing more. Uh, and maybe just to clarify, cultural diplomacy for us at the Institute is not winning the hearts and minds of foreign audiences or persuasion or propaganda, which it has been traditionally. For us, cultural diplomacy is building dialogue, understanding, and trust. We need to trust each other. Then we can do business. Then we can have investment. Then we can have tourism. That's the key challenge today. Um, uh, Ms. Gamble, I have a follow-up question for you, but you had an intervention, so... Uh. No, just, just to follow on with that, I mean, you have to remember that with every presidential election, with every cycle, we consistently see Americans literally debating whether or not they even need a foreign policy. Um, and the fact that we're doing that, you know, uh, after, the step, after the Second World War, after the Cold War, as if it's, uh, there's even a question, it is, really does speak to the body politic. I mean, there's a, there's a saying called, how does it play, it may play well in Washington, inside the Beltway, but how does it play in Peoria? And it really 
really is talking to those local governments, talking to people on the ground. One thing that I was going to mention that the UAE did a few years ago, which really played well for obvious reasons, is they made the largest ever private donation um, to um, Children's Hospital in the United States. And folks who had never even heard of the UAE before mm -hmm. recognized this as such a great gift. And I mean, when you're helping someone with their children, this is, this is something that at a grassroots level, everybody can understand that whatever culture you're living in, helping someone with their children is a great thing. So um, it's not about giving money, but it's also, a, it's really about focusing on the things that really matter to real people, you know, that are not just, you know, whatever the consistent news cycle might be. Uh, so my follow-up question, as we've seen in the findings of the report, um, Americans polled want to see more art, culture, science, and business stories uh, in the region. And I just wonder, um, obviously I understand CNBC is a bit of an exception because that's essentially the focus uh, of what you're doing. I mean, there's hard news, of course. But most journalists, um, when they get in touch with their editors, the editors would tell them, typically, I don't want fluff. Get me angry Arab faces, get me explosions, get me... Uh, so is there, do you think there is kind of a conflict between what the essence of modern day journalism is and what cultural diplomacy or nation brands uh, are? And um, as journalists, are we uh, mandated to kind of give the other side uh, of the equation as well so that we don't end up uh, with kind of a, a one-track mind on a particular yeah. nation or people. Well, I mean, I think there's absolutely a responsibility whether you're sitting, you know, in, in the chair of a business news journalist specifically focusing on companies and numbers um, as well as any general news journalist. One of the problems that I see, um, particularly uh, in this region, for example, um, there is a tendency to almost hide behind PR companies, whereas, um, you know, there is a real place for them, there is a real place for strategists, um, they're definitely necessary, we use them in the United States, people all over the world use them. My point is, is that I think that you really at some point have to allow the leadership to get out there and answer questions and really put the story out there. Um, you know, it's one of those things, you know, when you sit with a, uh, His Majesty King Abdullah and he's talking to you not only about, you know, what's happening outside the country in terms of the fight against terrorism and this kind of thing, but he's also talking to you about all the things he's trying to do to make life in Jordan better for people, to provide people with jobs, with dignity. Um, you really get a bigger picture of what this country is really about and who these people are. And I think that it would be um, a great thing to see more from the region in terms of the leadership getting out. I mean, you know, the journalists, there's a perception, I think, you know, that, that the media is really out to get you. You know, the problem is, um, I think for journalists, whether they're sitting in the United States or in Europe or anywhere else, you're always going to hear the title, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, and I think that the important thing is to create a consistent narrative uh, where people are not just hearing from one source what this country is, who these people are. It's really, really important, I think, to, to see the leadership of these different countries, whether it be uh, President Sisi from Egypt explaining why there's a state of emergency. You know, this kind of thing would actually really, really help. Great insight, Hadley. Let me take that uh, to uh, Nathan then. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not you agree with Mark on the fact that the American image isn't doing as well as perhaps uh, as it once uh, was. Uh, but then again, that's, uh, you know, that's why they've uh, some hired you to, uh, uh, <laughs> right. to kind of fix that uh, issue. I want to hear your thoughts about kind of, is there kind of a de deteriorating uh, kind of uh, brand America image? But more interestingly, I want to ask you, if the Arab League, uh, and we saw the Secretary General speaking here uh, yesterday, were to hire you to do your role in reverse. Oh. So you become the spokesperson for the Arab League yeah. in Washington. Yeah. And, you know, as we are based here in the region, we know for a fact that there is a Mars mission that is going to come out from the UAE. Yeah. There's so many achievements. It's Dubai, uh, the United Arab Emirates itself is a fantastic uh, success story. Saudi Arabia is going through its own transformation. There's the, you know, uh, visionary vision 2030. Yeah. Uh, the change is happening in terms of entertainment, uh, you know. Nobody would have uh, thought that we uh, would see a live concert, uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia, attended by males and, and females, sponsored by the government. So you have all these fantastic stories, but they get very little coverage in the U.S. media. What would you do differently? Well, look, uh, it, you need a long-term strategy and you need a short-term strategy, right? And on the short-term level, the, the key has to be, obviously, media engagement. You need to have... Uh, someone in your embassies who can be able to answer the, pick up the phone when an American journalist calls and be able to provide comments uh, without having to go back to your ministry in your capital to get that clearance to do so, right? You need to be able to give, empower your diplomats in Washington, D.C. and in your consulates around the United States to be able to freely engage with the media and, and take those kind of calculated risks that are necessary to get out ahead of the news cycle. Uh, and so that's incredibly important. 
Uh, but on, on the longer term sense, uh, I think it's incredibly important that Arab governments start to look at ways in which they can uh, encourage their own citizens to travel to the United States, to study in the United States, to take part in exchange programs, and vice versa as well, to encourage Americans, young Americans in particular, to travel to this region to learn Arabic, uh, to learn about Arab culture. You know, I, I fell in love with this region as a university student at Yale University, and I, I, I went on an exchange program in Yemen in 2007, and, you know, the, really the moment that I remember most clearly is sitting in a majlis, uh, you know, talking, you know, chewing cuts and, you know, talking about politics of the day uh, and, you know, eating Yemeni food and, and, and their, uh, their, you know, all, all the great sal salata and uh, things they have there in their dishes. Uh, and that's really what sort of clicked for me uh, when I realized that this is a great region with amazing people and a rich history and a, and a tradition. Uh, and I want more Americans to take advantage of that. And unfortunately, there are a lot of underprivileged Americans uh, from all walks of life, from all ethnic backgrounds, who don't have the financial resources to do so. I think Arab governments should consider strongly doing some more to help bring a wider range of Americans overseas to the Arab world, to sit in those majlises, to, to, you know, to smoke shisha in cafes, and to experience Arab culture firsthand. That's your long-term key to success. I was worried for a second you were going to say my ambition is to see more Americans to cut. So I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm, no, 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 I'm no, glad, no, absolutely I'm glad, not. I'm glad you didn't, didn't. The other side of the, the other yeah. part of the question, uh, yeah. Nathan, is America having a brand crisis? No, I, look, I, I really don't think so. Uh, first of all, I mean, if you want to look at the true measure of American power, it's not the number of aircraft carriers we have. It's not the number of ICBMs we have. It's the number of foreigners who have participated in American exchange programs and studied in our universities, okay? 565 current and former heads of state have participated in American exchange programs. 57 Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize laureates have participated in American exchange programs, okay? Every year, nine million foreigners around the world are, are, are touched in some way by American embassies and their cultural outreach programs. Uh, these programs are invaluable uh, for America's impact on the world and for our ability to implement our foreign policy, for our ability to build relationships with governments and government leaders. Uh, so I, I think that we've always been an open society. We've always been a society that's welcoming to foreigners and that wants to engage with the, out, with the outside world. Um, but we just do it in our, in our own special American way, that's all. Right. Um, um, the previous session went a bit over time, so I'm uh, going to use my credit with the AMF to go a bit over time. I want to see if there are any questions from the audience. Maybe you can take one or two questions. Uh, uh, do we have a microphone? Yes, if you can have it to the lady here, please. And then uh, Leila. I... Uh, I can't see the microphone, so for the sake of time, if you can just ask your question um, until, until we find the microphone. Oh, there it is. Well, uh, if you thank can kindly, you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Introduce yourself, yeah. please. My name is Amina Khairi. I'm a journalist working for Al Hayat uh, Newspaper Cairo office. Um, thank you very much for just, uh, it's a brilliant image regarding the Arabs in the US, I think, but I think it's much worse than we, we are listening to right now. I think um, I have this feeling that the image of Arabs in the US mainly nowadays it's only about ISIS and the explosions and what's happening in the Arab world after the so called Arab Spring. Um, and I think part of the responsibility comes within the Arab world. And I would like to listen from you as experts, I mean, what we as journalists or media people can do regarding this. It's not like making the image nicer or anything, but uh, there is a misunderstanding. There, there is lack of, you know, exchanging images. We have a bad image about Americans as well, um, and this needs a lot of work. I know cultural diplomacy is very important, but I don't think we're doing, we're touching even near that. So can we hear your own point of view? Very Thank good you. question. I mean, I have to say I'm a big fan of your work. I think you're one of the best featured writers in Hayat. If you can kindly <laughs> pass your, uh, the microphone to the first row here. We're going to take another question and then we'll give you an answer. Leila, please. Hi, Leila Hatoum of Newsweek Middle East and I have two questions, one for Hadley and the other ones for Nathan. And Hadley, um, during my work, my 17 years of work in journalism, I had encountered several reporters from the Western world who used to complain that their own institutions used to put agendas that um, prioritized basically the lives of um, Western citizens over Arabs over here, especially when they're covering the region. So if one American dies in this region, that's a story. Five Europeans, that's a story. Fifty end up Arabs, that might, con might constitute a story. So have you countered that during your work? 
uh, with CNBC. And uh, for Nathan, do you think just like basically bringing students over here from the US to smoke shisha and learn about the region, it would change anything? It's a two-way channel, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Don't you think that your government ought to do more to uh, channel their media to cover this region more um, uh, positively or basically more objectively? Right, uh, so we have a series of questions there. Um, we're gonna take one more round, just let us get some uh, answers. Mark, let me start with you. Uh, Amina has a point. If there are explosions happening, if there is a bunch of lunatics who've declared the country called uh, ISIS happening and they're spreading like a virus on social media, disgusting videos, uh, they seem to care less about the image of Arabs or Islam in, in general. People really don't have time to sit and talk about cultural diplomacy and, you know, I understand your point of view, but maybe we can discuss this uh, this way, etc. There are more pressing uh, issues. Is this one of the challenges you face that, you know, we perhaps need to make time for uh, cultural diplomacy and if we do, perhaps then we wouldn't kind of generalize or stereotype a whole uh, people? Good question. Now, we would argue at the Institute, cultural diplomacy can be helpful and historically has been helpful in peaceful relationships, conflict zones, and post-conflict zones. Uh, different strategies, of course, are necessary for each. Consistency is very important also. You can't have one foreign policy and one cultural diplomacy, but it can work. Uh, look at, let's say, South Africa and Rwanda as two great examples where post-conflict reconciliation did happen, uh, and it was a success. So I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. I would argue that Dubai and the Emirates right now are in perfect situation to do more cultural diplomacy in the sense you've achieved already stability uh, in terms of trade, commerce, et cetera. Just looking at the zigzag route of our airplane to actually get here in terms of the, the airspaces, you can see it's a very difficult region, many challenges. Uh, so I think not necessarily for every country, but Emirates would be in an excellent position right now to really do more soft power. We're very happy about this new initiative and cultural diplomacy. So yes, it can work in each of those. Of course, it requires different strategies. Uh, and if you have a, a conflict going on, it's very, very difficult as well. The key thing I think cultural diplomacy can do is to help make it harder for extremists. Uh, and I think extremists on both sides. Let's make it more difficult to get away with generalizations. Uh, a leader of any sort, religious leader or political leader, when they say this group is entirely like this or this group is entirely like that, let's make it more difficult for them by having more education, by having more exchange. And that's, I think, exactly a contribution cultural diplomacy can do now uh, in conflict zones and also post-conflict zones. Hadley, I'm going to get back to you to talk a bit about your challenges uh, at work. I want to go to uh, Nathan. And just, uh, just as a comment, if I may interview, I think the US government does a fantastic job. Um, I've been on the IV program myself. Myself. Yeah. So not very, very countries spend that much need money to bring people to the U.S. so that they can see um, a different aspect of the country. And I do hope our Arab countries uh, kind of uh, adopt a similar uh, yeah. program. Absolutely. Um, I, I suppose you get this question a lot. Um, um, not many people realize that perhaps the U.S. government has no sway over the, the media. Right. But um, there's American interests at, at stake here. And, uh, you know, perhaps uh, a word uh, or two with the big networks or the newspapers that, you know, Islam is not the enemy, as you know, uh, etc. Do you see yourself ever engaging in similar activities? Has it ever happened? Do you think it will happen? Uh, well, look, uh, as you said, you know, obviously we have a free press in the United States. Uh, and so... Uh, I, as a government official, uh, am very limited in my ability to influence uh, domestic American media coverage of, of foreign countries. Quite frankly, the, the responsibility uh, falls on the shoulders of Arab governments to take up that burden. Uh, and it's not something that we can do for you. Uh, but that's good. That's a good story. Because frankly, only you can tell your own story. Uh, and in fact, your best ambassadors and your best diplomats are not those who work for your foreign ministry. It's your people. It's your young people in particular and your students. You know, I think when, when Americans look at a city like Dubai, you know, we, we see something of that reflected in ourselves, right? We see that, that, um, that ambition, that diversity, that openness, that willingness to do the crazy idea. We see that in ourselves and we love it. Um, so, you know, you guys, I mean, the, the Arab world has an incredible amount of assets, cultural assets and soft power assets that you can leverage very effectively in the United States. And, and I wish you the best of luck because quite frankly, uh, it's, it's incredibly important for for, for both of our sides to ensure that there's, there's a strong people-to-people -people relationship. Um, Hadley, uh, before we take two more questions, you want to yeah. tell us a bit about your uh, challenges? So uh, I would definitely say it's a challenge depending on what news network you're working for, to be honest. Um, you know, with CNBC, we are business news focused, and that's why I always really go harping back to the fact that transparency is so important to us because we're always talking about, you know, earnings and businesses, and if you have a business that they're telling you everything's really, really going well, but you can't see any numbers, I mean, you're open to questioning that, right? Um, but, but in terms of other news organizations, think about it this way in the reserve situation. If you're in the United States and 40 Americans die, but, you know, three Egyptians are killed also, or two Iraqis 
Iraqis are killed also, the story will probably lead in your country with, yesterday this happened and you know three Egyptians were killed, two Iraqis, and oh, by the way, 40 Americans. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a targeted um, you know, campaign not to report on things, but I definitely see your point there. And I think that unfortunately, with the fact that there's so much happening on a daily basis in a daily news cycle, getting the good stories or getting the positive stories out there is a constant challenge. I mean, we're working on a program right now in Saudi Arabia, which is going to focus on, um, it's seven episodes in seven weeks, we're going to shoot it over the next couple of weeks, and it's really focusing on people who aren't in the ministries, they're not government officials, they are not royal family members, they are people who are actually working in the country, doing real things, um, and you know, they're working mothers, you know, these kinds of things, like trying to bring that very human aspect um, of the business narrative to a bigger audience. Um, but it really is about how much airtime can you argue for. You know, this kind of stuff, it, it really does, you know, make a difference. And as I say, with a lot of print, for example, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, unfortunately, that's something that all of us struggle with. I don't care what news network you're going for, but with CNBC, it's much more business news focused, so we don't generally have that problem. Um, is there an uh, airing date for that program, or is it still in the making? I'm shooting it over the next two weeks. Oh, okay, so, great. Yeah, so, so Ramadan. Well, let us know if Arab News can help in any way. <laughs> um, I'll take two more questions. Um, unfortunately, we're quickly running out of time. I'll take the gentleman here and uh, the lady in the uh, first row. Um, I apologize to this side of the house. We'll see if they would allow us a few more minutes. I'll try to accommodate as many as possible, please. Thank you very much, Abdullah Shaiji from the Political Science Department, Kuwait University. As a professor of political science, uh, US politics, and international relations who studied in the United States, attended the University of Texas at Austin, uh, I teach US politics. Uh, it's a way to a street. My question is to Nathan Tech. The issue of the mainstream media in the United States, the Hollywood, and how they depict Arabs and Muslims, it's becoming really annoying a lot. Like, for instance, when somebody is killed in, in, in one of the U.S. cities, the first, the first line is, is the killer a Muslim? When American, white American or black American is killed, you talk about domestic violence. I mean, the terminology that is used is really very stereotypical, and also depicting Arabs and Muslims, associating them with terrorism, profiling, the name, the, even, even the immigrants now, even Americans who pay taxes are being really now uh, targeted. With President uh, Trump comes and he slaps the, the, the Muslim ban, and then he slaps only the GCC countries from uh, Emirates, from Qatar, from Kuwait, with the laptop and with the more than uh, your iPhone in order to benefit American carriers. This is really is getting uh, us really in a confrontational mood. Thank you, Dr. That we needs we really, really need to be. We really no, no, need to move I'm up. Just no, 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 we, just we get the idea. Uh, no, no, I'm just Nathan, 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 please, can you one, pass the microphone to the lady? One, one last line, one last line. What do you expect uh, is needed from the Trump administration and from the other, our side? To in order to reconcile this really, this really serious, uh, serious issue between the two uh, people, the Americans and the, the Arabs and Muslims. So thank you for that. Doctor, if you can kindly pass the microphone. Nathan, I'll get back to you. There are yeah. two sides of the question, one regarding the media again and one about the U.S. government uh, policies. Uh, please. Hi, my name is Zabir Aboushmais, uh, and uh, my interest in cultural diplomacy comes from the fact that I I'm a Fulbright scholar, and uh, thank you. So it, it was great, and uh, this is something I struggle with, and this is something that Mark also touched on, and maybe it's a good thing that I'm asking after that question, because, so my frustration with this is, uh, I always thought that the problem with misunderstanding, misunderstanding between cultures, it comes from lack of exposure, but then comes exposure, and that builds a lot more, like, adversity, and, uh, a lot of more sweeping generalizations about cultures, cer certain people from certain nationality, etc. Um, what is like mind-boggling for me is that there is more exposure than ever, and you can actually talk to anybody in a small town in uh, Iowa right now if you want. But how come nothing is changing uh, in terms of like building trust and understanding? It's, I mean, of course there is some change, but in reality, there's a lot more war and a lot of more adversity in the world, and I'm just 
throwing this at you because Thank you. something we, we got the point. I'm going to allow one more question. Again, I think I'm running out of credit with the Arab Media Forum. So the, because uh, the lady over here, the uh, final uh, question, and I'll get back to you for comments and closing uh, uh, remarks. Just right here, please. Thank you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محدثتكم حليمه الملا صحفيه في مجله مرامي التي I'm a journalist at Marami newspaper which is issued by the Hayab Family Affairs Council in Sharjah. No doubt current media is considered one of the key pillars of government governments worldwide at the economic level and at the the culture level and so on, and even at the military level, especially in the wake of uh, uh, realizing that these uh, these mechanisms have been uh, playing a critical role in uh, uh, wars and management and uh, management of uh, conflicts, and they are shaping uh, the uh, international uh, uh, community. So I have to translate your question. So. Uh, please give us a question, direct question, so I would translate it. To what extent uh, did the American media manage uh, to affect or to shape uh, an enlightened uh, public opinion? Final questions, and these are going to be the, the final uh, comments. Um, the question from the lady here, Mark, um, I'm going to uh, address you with it. How long does it take to change a perception or change uh, an image? Uh, Hadley, if you can answer the question about the role of, uh, of the media. Uh, Nathan, uh, we know that the travel ban has been uh, reversed. What can uh, Arab lobbies in the United States, uh, Arab media do uh, to help influence decision making uh, in, um, in America? Uh, Mark, we start with you. Sure, to the cultural diplomacy question, I think the reason why, despite the fact that there's so much exposure uh, in the American media, etc., is exactly the problem that the presentation of Arab countries is one thing, the perception is another thing, and the reality is something else. And I think that's the job of cultural diplomacy, to try to connect, to make sure that actually the presentation matches the perception and the reality. That's the job of cultural diplomacy, and that's where I was saying the Arab countries, especially the Emirates, perfect situation, perfect timing right now to, to do more of that. How long will it take? It depends, obviously, case by case. There's no general answer for that, uh, but the quicker that we we can, let's say, rectify the, the, the problem between the perception, uh, the presentation, and the reality, the quicker it will come. And of course, the ancient wisdom is uh, a reputation arrives on foot and leaves on a horseback. So the good stuff takes time to build up, but when there's a negative image, it spreads quickly. Not always. Again, the more consistency that there is, the faster it will go. Uh, so that really depends on the countries too. But a country that already has established itself as a bridge country in terms of trade, economics, etc., is much better suited than a country that currently has a conflict going on. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Hadley, the question about the, the role uh, from the lady here um, uh, from Sharjah about the role of media. Do you feel that you have, throughout your work at CNBC or your uh, various other experience, that you've managed to kind of correct a perception just by doing your job as a you know, fair and unbiased uh, journalist? Do you, do you feel any, do you have any story you can share with us that you've managed to change perception about this part of the world? Oh, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to remember that you're speaking to, for us in particular with CNBC International, we're speaking to an audience of of, you know, as I say, um, high net worth individuals who really understand the region because they're, you're investing here, they're looking uh, to grow companies and that kind of thing. But when you're talking about, you know, more broadly, I think that, you know, uh, you know when, when I first moved to Dubai several years ago, my mother, all she could say was, why, Hadley, it's so near Iran. <laughs> That's all she could say. You know, she knew nothing about the country. I think that when it comes down to understanding cultures, you really have to be crafting your own narrative. Part of that is transparency. Part of that is really getting out from behind these PR companies and these press releases and really going out there and, and being available to answer questions on a real basis. But also, we're living in a time when we're more connected than we've ever been. And while that does mean that the news cycle is, is you know, inflated with, with so many things you could choose from, that also means that you have the opportunity to talk to people. You can do it digitally. You can do it on television. There are so many, there are hundreds of cable channels. Um, you can do it online in any way that you see fit. Twitter, I mean, even. So, I mean, there's a way to craft your narrative. There's a way to become an influencer. You can be sitting at home, you know, doing your laundry and still be actively, you know, politically involved. This is something that, you know, we never had before. So I would say that the most important thing, I think, is to begin crafting your own narrative. Take it away from other people who you don't feel are doing it very well and start speaking for yourself. 
Thank you, Hadley. Uh, uh, Nathan, yeah. uh, last but not least, um, the doctor's question is, he raises a fair point. As I mentioned earlier, um, throughout different phases, there's sort of certainly a lot of anger towards some of the, the sure. U.S. policies. What can we do to help uh, influence uh, decision-making in Washington? Well, sir, uh, with regard to your question about the American media, look, I'll give you some insight from my perspective. I'm an American spokesperson whose job it is to address the Arab media. And oftentimes I see in the Arab media uh, misreporting about American policy. I see conspiracy theories. I see, you know, uh, a, a constant sort of attack on American foreign policy. My response to that is not to get upset. It's not to boycott channels. It's not to try to punish channels in any way or punish journalists. Rather, the answer is always to engage. The answer is always to go on air, to, to go in that space and contest the space so that your adversaries or the people who are speaking badly against you don't have that opportunity to do so, right? If you don't tell your own story, someone else will do it for you and they won't do as good of a job, right? So uh, the answer is always to be engaging, to be out there, to be taking those risks. Uh, and, and frankly, I, I, I really, really encourage uh, and am encouraged by the, the, the acts of and the actions of the Emiratis and of the, of the, of the Saudis and of uh, our Arab partners, and I want to see more, and I, I really encourage that. Thank you so much. I personally do not want to be boycotted or punished by the Arab <laughs> Media Forum, so I'm going to have to draw this fantastic panel discussion to an end. I have to say, I've learned quite a lot uh, talking to you. Thank you so much, Mark, Hadley, and Nathan, and thank you all for being such a fantastic audience. Thank you so much.